the, the earth is not becoming one cubus, uh, one cubic wall. Uh, no, no. It would be maybe more easy for us when it's one, uh, <laughs> one square box. One square box, yeah. Yeah? <laughs> it would be more easy for us to understand. But it doesn't happen to be one square box, it's one ball. Yeah, yeah. yeah where the perspective is changing all the time. I don't know, maybe I talk only bullshit anyway. No, no, but you can see it from the photographs, from, from the outer yeah. space. We pumped another meter, I would say. If you look at the opening, I think we got another meter. But I think that might be enough for us to start taking away stuff under the sundial stone because it's reachable now. But we're also gonna fill it with some more water from the water truck. Yeah, no, good work, good work. We're cleaning the most important monumental side of this called Lemmingham Temple, the entrance of Lemmingham Temple. My initial idea was that this year we could come to that point where we can see how is fixed this stone, so that we without problem can take away everything that is there, because when the stone is fixed... You mean sundial rock? Under the, so the rocks under the sundial rock we can take away when we know how it's fixed. Because now it looks like a falling down. Right. So we have to find out. So the only way to find out is to take away material behind the concrete, mm -hmm. wash it away. It will come down more and more material from underneath. And one has to look and shout very hard if there is any movement. But we can see that. Where, where would the stone go? If it's not moving, we can take more material away. So it's mm -hmm. only to check every now and then and keep using the brain. Right. Yeah, because it's a big stone yeah. and I don't know how, I know from the story it's fixed somehow, but I have no idea how, because I can't see it. So now we can try to figure out with this kind of pump, because it's stuck somehow, a lot of pressure. So we need to look what inside. The reason why this is not working at the moment is different than because it was working until it stopped. Now it's not any pumping anymore. Atte has a better pump that we can borrow hmm? that is made for pumping dirty water. Oh really? Uh. But let's see if they, with the because it's already a, 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 I put out some yeah there is a kind of stones and uh, you know many stuff inside. Wow, so that's why we lose the power because of that stones. It is material that is covering the entrance to Lemminkainen Temple because they closed it up by filling up the whole uh, the <laughs> cave that is in the mountain, which would lead to a round room. And from there you go stairs up towards Lemminkainen Temple, but I have no idea how deep. It shows something, the image, the radar image they have, but it's, for me it's not clear enough to say. Uh, so, it's only to take out the material and we see what we see. But that's a big job on the inside. But the outside, when we really make that beautiful and we can get it back next year, in the end of the summer, in one bedrock space, and we take all this other material away. It might cost a little bit money, but with the help from the people in the surrounding and the connections we have, it's not exaggerated. It's like, you know, if there is a little bit capital available, we can do it and clean up the outside, and it will look so incredible. So, uh, you know, it's like... Uh... Today, many people use this word understanding. I understand this, I understand that. When they really mean to believe, because believing and understanding, as I see it, are opposites. To believe something requires absolutely no proof or evidence. But understanding cannot exist without proof or evidence. 
So people, we have this belief today. And I, I think that one true understanding has more value than a thousand beliefs. If there was some way we could take our brains out of our head and have a small dish of water in front of us and we could wash out all the beliefs and put the brain back into the skull, only truth would be left. So the difference between believing, a belief you can change, whereas an understanding you cannot change. You can add to an understanding. I give one example of an understanding. I understand that without the sun, there is no life. And if there's no life, there's no consciousness or intelligence. In just a few minutes, if the sun went out, this, the waters on this planet would freeze, everything in darkness would die. There would be no life, there'd be no consciousness, there'd be no intelligence. So the way the people used to see this in the old time, in the time before the church, they understood that the sun was the creation. It created the life. So for them, the sun was alive. It stands to reason that if the sun is creating the life, the consciousness, it must be these things itself. So they saw the sun as alive. So when they built this temple for the sun, they thought that the sun was looking down on the people and smiling and su lin, su lin. That now the people are making a, a sun temple for me, the sun, if I was the sun. And they also saw that the moon was conscious also. Today we just think of it as a hot ball of gas and a coal rock. But the sun kind of represents the sound pan. U is a ring, Ra is the moon, and Ma is the earth. So the pan, the sun, and the moon could look down on the earth, the Ma, in one panorama or panorama in English. So the sun is very special. So I've added to one understanding. You can keep adding to an understanding. And this is such something I wanted to say about believing and understanding. If we could eliminate all beliefs, these beliefs can be very, very dangerous. Today, this people believe and we do all kinds of crazy things. But maybe one day in the future, we don't have to believe anymore, we can understand. I hope this is what the Bach Saga brings to the humanity. We don't have to believe anymore. And I think that's some little Kella that I had, one little thought that I had to say. So now we have to take from the top, behind the concrete, the material away to see where the stone ends. And then when we see, ah, there it ends, then we know that if the stone not move, we can take it away without problem. So the whole entrance become more white. And we, if we then find out that, hey, it's fixed in some form, we can take away all the material from, we just wash it out. And we see how it's fixed in there. Yeah. But that's a quite big operation already, and we have to do it easy. And I'm sure when it's like this roadway going down, then you can already imagine that that roadway at the corner, where you go really down, it go up to the mountain. And you take all that material away, so it become like, fuck, it become like one big pan, like one big, that's going into this klufta which go behind the Eta Stupa further on to this cave. Where in the end it should be like some kind of water lock in order to be able to let this place run full of water to close the possibility to go to the Lemminkainen temple. And when you take out the plug and you have this whole cave full of water, you have to wait till the water comes out and you can see how it can easily go down the mountain on that side in the direction of the sea 
because we know how the landscape is looking there. Yeah? yeah. So it's kind of, you know, it sounds strange, but there really is this possibility because the story is so detailed. Yeah, so that is also the reason why we, after 32 years, are still here. <laughs> <laughs> doing what we are doing because uh, we think it's worth to do it yeah? and also it's because we can understand it because we have been listening over 26 and almost 27 years to this story so why would these people sit there from generation to generation from thousand years back and tell bullshit to the next generation for to make us jump here like monkeys I mean if you are having to do something with the existence of the human being, I don't think you will bullshit on this point, you know. There is no reason. There is absolutely no reason why it would not be like they tell. And that was also what he have to say, you know. Like, uh, now we can see if Knut and Rea Bokström have been honest or not. You know? So we can see. Okay? And the unfolding of all the happenings with this story and our larger understanding of it today than, of course, when we started 1987, make that today we can kind of quite logically explain the existence of this thing. But it has to do already with the creation of the earth. And that, has all, that is all told in Boxaga. So why would, why we have this, just this nature on that spot where is Gumbu Viken, Gumbu Strand, Gumbu Dal, Gumbu Kul, Blokul, Gumbu Berriet, and on the Klufta, and Sibu Berriet, and between them is the Atestupa, which only is for Akka to fall down, because she fall in front of the entrance to Lemminkainen Temple, which was only for men. And there's all these names, Ibu, Kupaliwari, and all this kind of fairy tale story of Kupaliwari, where the witches go with their broom to clean the mountain. And there is like all this story that exists. <coughs> yeah, and we have the story of all these six, uh, these seven daughter of uh, of. Uh, Lemminkainen and Jods, and they get seven daughters who get all the title Noitia. And they are Tar, they are ladies. So this Noitia, which means in English witch, they, be, they are the ones who are making the Tari Noita. And Tari Noita means the stories in Finnish language. So the name by itself is saying that it's these ladies who have been making up this kind of story which is living in the collective brain of people all over the planet in some form. We have this kind of story everywhere. I wanted to also say about a, an ancient heading or Paakan or heathen money system they had before. We had one coin system where this king, the king lived on the hill and he looked down on the people. And this king every year, we had three classes of people. We had what we call Jarl, Carl, and Trail, which we would call today upper income, middle income, and lower income. And these people who lived in the village, in the town, uh, they were the craftsmen. They had uh, they had crafts. They had a baker, and they had a shoemaker, and somebody a uh, blacksmith, let's say. And this king, every year, he would send a man down to these car people, the middle class people, and he would give them a sack of coins. And let's say this is the year one, and he would give out this year one. And these people, the baker, the candlestick maker the blacksmith, the shoemaker, they would trade these coins back and forth to each other. And then in the next year, this king, he would send the same guy down with another sack of coins with the year two and the king's picture because the, the coins belonged to the king. They didn't belong to the people. 
and now he come with his new coin year two and he would give these coins out to the people to this middle class people and now they would return all the year one coins back to this man so he could take them back to the king and in this system no one could collect I couldn't be pass on these 15 coins that I kept from year one to my son and now he collects 15 more coins and he gives it to his son and he collects 15 and now 10 generations we've collected all these coins everybody had to give the coins back so there was no banks there was no collecting system it was a very honest system today this collecting and collecting collecting is a we all see what happens when these people start to collect large amounts of money and the small people they have nothing and these people they keep getting richer and this was a it was a very old money system we had before nobody could nobody could collect we had to give it all back to the king it was kind of symbolic so we really didn't walk around with so many coins if you went back to the 19, middle of the 19th century, people didn't walk around with much money in their pocket. When the Industrial Revolution came, we started to collect and collect, and now we have like it is today. If you went back a long time ago, the people wore lean or linen as the underclothes, and they used hemp or hemp or what we would call ganja in India, this hemp in English. Uh, we use that as a second layer, but these people, they need the men, they needed a bear skin to cover their body in the winter because it became very cold here. So every boy at 21 would make one long stav or stick and carve one very sharp point on the end of it. And I think this, I think this, this pole was maybe, uh, oh, maybe 10 feet tall, nine, three meters or so. And they knew where these bears were hibernating. They knew where they were in their caves. And this boy, when he's 21, he has to get his own bear skin. So he would come to this cave where this bear is inside. And this bear has been laying on one side from the time he goes there. I think the 13th of December, this bear has to come out and go back in and lay on the other side because he can't lay all the time on one side. But this boy, he would come and he would scream at this bear who's inside of his, his little cave or his eye, wherever he's hibernating. And this bear could hear that now there's some, something going on out there. And when this bear comes out from this cave, he's been laying for months like this. He can't just come and charge you. He has to stand up and stretch. And then he can go down, then he can come after you. But they knew the timing of this bear. So when this bear came out of the cave and as he went, ah, just as he was coming back, was an instant where this boy could come and put this long, sharp stick right under his pump, or as we call it, the heart today. And as this bear's coming down, this, and now he had his bear skin for his lifetime. And if there was a small cub bear, they took it back to the house and this little bear would live with the people inside the house for the rest of the winter. And in the spring, the little bear goes back and he becomes his bear again. And every man had to have a bear skin to be stay warm. This is a little bear story of yours. It's nice. He also had a story about ducks. We sit up in the north and they have very, very many mosquitoes out here. Us people, we complain because sometimes you, you, they're everywhere There's certain times. But these ducks, they needed this mosquito for food so they could get the power to fly south every, every winter. But these people before, they understood that if they took and they chopped a hole in a, in a, in a small lake or pond in front of somewhere on their land, uh, these ducks, 200 of these ducks on the way south would land in this hole in the ice and they would sit and keep this ice from melt from freezing in this hole by the, because they constantly make this action like this and as the winter went along they would kill these ducks one by one or two by two 
so they have food in the winter in the winter these ducks and then by the end of the winter the ducks were all eaten the next year they made another hole so more ducks 200 ducks could come and land in this hole the nature is here for us to use but when we don't use it anymore it goes away and this was a nice little duck story about how these people had fresh duck to eat all winter long in this dark cold winter that they have to face up here in this north as these Scandinavians know, you know these Finnish people know. A little duck story.